So that's the last of my announcements. <clears throat> All right, so I'm going to jump in here and talk about the rest of sentiment, which is going to be our section on um, supervised learning approaches. But since we've already done a whole chapter on supervised classification, I thought we would also talk about topics as a way to understand the results from one's classification answers. Additionally, well, I'm also going to show you the dangers of including punctuation. So first place we're going to start is basically we're here, right? We did text blob and AFIN and Vader and Cinti WordNet, and we kind of got stuck at 70% accuracy because we do have the answers. And surely we can do better than that. <clears throat> okay. We're not going to try every possible combination like we did in the classification lecture. But what we're going to do is try um, the count vectorizer and the TF-IDF to kind of see if we can do better. Okay. So we could take all of those techniques we learned in the last uh, classification section. So we did count vectorizers, TF-IDF, and word to vec as our feature extractors. Then we did log, support vector machines, and naive bays as our um, learning algorithms. So we could like create this a nine by nine or three by three square again. I won't bore you with it, but um, <clears throat> all of those techniques still apply. So let's just try one of them. Okay. So I'm going to do the bag of words approach with my count vectorizer. Okay. So remember, you import the count vectorizer. I did binary equals false because I want the actual counts. Minimum proportion that it has to occur is, you know, it just has to be in the data set. Maximum proportion, it could be used in every document, which would be a little unusual. And then this is new, so this ingram range. So we're doing ingrams of one and of pairs. So that creates a larger vocabulary. We're going to train it up. Okay, so remember our data set is split into testing and training already. And so we're, you remember you spit transform the first time and just transform the second time. Okay, on your test features. <clears throat> Same thing now this time with the TF-IDF. Okay? It also has this ingram range option. So you can move up to larger phrases to help capture some of context. Um, that does make the, the um, vocabulary a lot larger, which is good, but makes the matrix a lot sparser, which can be problematic. But here's another thing we can tweak. We could do one word at a time, two words, three, et cetera. So this does one and two. Uh, the sublinear transform is true. just really helps if you're going to have a very sparse ma matrix. All right, fit transform, transform. Let's see what works here. Uh, so we can apply any one of these. Use one, two, three, four, five, Yes, exactly. So one, use by uh, unigrams or one grams and use by grams, two grams. And it treats them differently. Although, in a way, that means that they're no longer, the, the data is not uh, independent. Right. But in general, because uh, it can count here and here, but in general, most language data is not independent because of uh, common phrases. So, you know, that assumption is tenuous at best for language research either way. <clears throat> All right, so we can apply any one of them. Let's just do log. So I'm going to fit my logistic regression to a bag of words model. I notice how I'm using these uh, with different names. You'll see this on the next slide. Okay. So my log regression for bag of words, okay. I fit to my count vectorized train features and train sentiments. I grab the predictions for those using my log bag of words model. I predict the test features. And then I use this display model performance metrics. You can also use the classification report from scikit-learn. And check out how much better we do just like not even trying very hard. Right? So if I have the type of training data, this a bag of words model is going to do much better. Right? 
And so we're getting almost 91% accurate. And that's pretty evenly spread between positive and negative. So remember, you always want to check your precision and recall by category to make sure that one group isn't way better than the other group. Effectively, <clears throat> excuse me, we're trying to make sure that there isn't one classification label that we're not predicting at all. Okay. Because sometimes in the model performance, the accuracy can hide the fact that one of the categories is really bad, depending on the split of the data. So we're pretty evenly missing positive and negative, but 91%, that's much better than our 70%. Okay. So in general classification, supervised classification tends to perform better than unsupervised, right, because there's more tuning available. But unsupervised methods are useful when you don't have another option. <clears throat> All right, so now let's try the TF IDF. So TF named them different things. And okay, that's important, because when you, for the um, classification homework, you're building multiple models, and you name them the same thing, you're overriding the original. So be sure you name them different things. So we're fitting our data, we're predicting the data, let's look at the report. And this case is about 90%. So they're relatively equal. I would probably in this scenario go with the simpler model, which is slightly better, which is the cow vectorized model. Alright, there, I mean the model results are almost exactly the same, honestly. Okay, when that happens, go with the simpler model. Simpler model when it comes to the type of extraction and when it comes to the type of algorithm. Although I don't know if I would say that log is simpler than Bayes. So then it could just be your favorite algorithm. Okay, so you can do even more of that with word to vec I'm just going to show you topics instead of doing nine different models. Okay. You could apply this idea to deep learning models. Okay. Now the nice thing about deep learning models is, you know, with word to vec the input is context and the output is what word would appear in that context. Okay. And that's kind of the flow of word to vec Input, the words around it, hidden layer, output, the word that would be like the next word, okay, the context of the word. Uh, the thing about deep learning models is you can actually make them do both halves. So we used word to vec to create the feature structure that we then put through an algorithm. Deep learning models allow you to do both at the same time. So you have an input system, a bunch of hidden layers, and then the output can actually be your answer. Okay. Um, that's just not how word to vec is designed. Um, so I have used a couple of deep learning models and I have my personal experience, um, they have performed as well as, with lots of training, <laughs> um, as well as logistic regression models. But obviously, if I think about time and effort, it takes a lot more time to deal with the deep learning model. So I went with the logistic regression one because it runs faster and is more efficient. But that's not true for everything. There are some things where deep learning models are more efficient, like uh, translation problems. And so I've included the link that like takes you directly to um, one of the textbook chapters, as far as I'm aware, unless they've moved it. Um, it's an IPython notebook, which means it's a Jupyter notebook, uh, but you can look at the code and see how they do uh, back of words models, which is what we just did, or um, uh, supervised deep learning with Keras. 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 Okay. <clears throat> uh, can we use TensorFlow, Keras, GPU, and the R script for running? Okay, let me reread this. So, TensorFlow or Keras, GPU, and R script for using. Yes? I think I understand what you're asking. Like, can you make Keras run? Like, I. Can you rephrase your question? I'm not sure if I'm answering it well. <clears throat> so, 
Sorry, I don't, I think I'm missing something key that will keep me from actually answering this. There is a character who allows... Huh. Okay. I've learned two new things this week. Um, I, okay. So my answer is, I don't, I'm not aware of that, but my best guess is the answer to your question is yes. Um, because I, you can use Keras in R, and what it does is it talks to TensorFlow's Python backend. So like the R package converts it to Python, talks to TensorFlow, and comes back. Um, I've done one in R and one, um, several in Python, so, and I haven't had any issues. But I have not played with the, I've played with the TensorFlow GPU thing, but not Keras. So the answer is probably yes. <clears throat> Oh, back to the IPython notebook, sorry. And so it's got an example that you can walk through. Okay. It um, kind of shows you like how to build a deep neural network. Uh, it's very complicated. Like this is a pretty complex model because that is a lot of layers. Uh, those take a long, long time to run unless you just have almost no data. So what I tell you to do is just pick is to pick a, like a section of the model to run. Um, I also have some other notes on um, how to build smaller models to like learn and play with. But this is a the notes example that I'm linking here is a very complex model. I will tell you that. Because it's got what like. One, two, three, four dense layers. Phew. That's a lot. Yes. I'm sorry. <laughs> I wish there was something I could do, but I don't think I can go outside and be like, Rod, can you stop mowing the lawn? <laughs> Unfortunately, he's doing it right between our two houses, right outside my window. So. <clears throat> I see you typing. I was waiting to see if you had a question before I moved on. Okay. Allow us to interpret which features are important, like a random forest would get feature importance. No. Uh, as far as I can tell, my, no. There are some... The problem is like these, like a, a, even a word to vec model. Right, in a deep model, what you're doing is building these mathematical vectors, sometimes called tensors, that represent the best combination to predict whatever that output is. And so you're abstracting it away from the words themselves and the context to these like mathematical probabilities. So sometimes it's hard to get it back. Now, that being said, I know if you're really interested in this question, you can ask Jonathan Korn. So for his PhD thesis, he's working on finding a way to take a deep learning model that he's running in Keras, and it predicts, but then using topics modeling to extract what it is that's predicting. Because that's the question I kept asking him. I'm like, what? these models predict, but why? But how? Like, what is it that predicts? Is it only positive words? Is it only negative words? Is it... Is it a random word? Like, what is it? So he's he's actually working on that for his dissertation. Um, and to me, that's one of the biggest limitations of these models when it comes to understanding how you've come up with a good model. But in a lot of business contexts, people don't care, right? Like, it predicts. Great. Moving on. Um, but I think that we maybe can see that that's not always the best <laughs> approach. Um, if you're really interested in that idea, I tell you to read Kathy O'Neill's um, Weapons of Math Destruction, which is about algorithms and big data and how we've just so like allowed allowed them to become biased just like people are. It's a really fascinating book that talks about the kind of the problems that these models have 
inherently built into them in that humans build them and humans put in the data and garbage in, garbage out kind of things. It's really great. Um, but it gets at that exact kind of like your question of like, what is it that's predicting? Well, you know, when, when they build models to decide who should get a loan for like a house or whatever, um, they, you know, they put in all of your numbers that they reduce you down to and it goes beep, 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 bop, and it says yes or no, but they haven't really examined how those are biased against certain groups of people. And that's what the book is about. She's also really fascinating to follow on Twitter if you like a Twitter nut. Um, it's a great book. <coughs> yeah. Sweet. Okay, so that's the Amazon one. This link is in the notes. <coughs> I highly recommend. She's done a couple of um, TED Talks, I think, too. She's one of those like really fascinating science people who actually talks at like the level that you can understand. Okay, so that being said, let's get into this topic. Oh, there's two chapters, sorry. There's two links. And think about that exact question. So how do I know what is actually happening. And I don't know that I think that this is the only answer, but topics modeling is definitely a way to kind of think about um, what's in the data that might be allowing us to predict the positive and negative ones. Right? So with a simple log regression or a naive Bayes, you can write uh, an account vectorizer, right, or a TF-IDF. You can write some extra code pieces that will show you which words had higher probabilities for um, brain fart for each category, right? So I can turn that into a list of the most popular features. Uh, they don't always make a lot of sense, uh, <laughs> but they're there. Okay. Um, so there's a way to re-extract, essentially, the, the dimensions from the model and figure out which model dimensions were the most predictive and then convert that into which words those were. Um, and you do that by looking at the coefficients and figuring out which coefficient is which column and which column is which word. Okay, so it requires a little bit of like extra back steps, but you can do it. Okay. Um, another thing that you can do to just even like predictive model or not to figure out like what is in this data? Like I want to know um, you know, what's happening in the data. And um, I really just like topics models because I think they're really cool and they're very popular. So <clears throat> learning a new thing. So what causes some of that prediction? So we could use a confusion matrix to think about where we're getting the answers wrong. And in this case, we're getting them equally wrong. So it's not like it's one, it's just the negatives or just the positives that are screwing things up. They're equal, um, and then that doesn't really tell me. Um, that'll tell me something maybe where to start. So if I'm never getting one of the categories right, I would start to go through the the documents in that category and see if there's a common theme that we're missing. So maybe it's that people are using um, more stop words, and as silly as that sounds, like okay, well let's put the stop words back in, let's see if that helps. Uh, so visualization sometimes is going to be key here for really just figuring it out. So one simple thing we could do is split the data um, into positive and negative and just look at the most frequent words for each review. Right? This would just be take our um, TF IDF or our count vectorizer and just pull out the top 100 most frequent words right? or most weighted words. And they might overlap a lot. And the ones that they overlap on are probably not very predictive. And it would be the ones that were distinct. Because if they overlap in the same way, that you can't tell the difference between them, right? Um, but a simpler solution um, would be to create a model that best represents what the underlying dimensions are in the data. But I'm going to start by just thinking about predicting. So let's say we've got a new data set. Well, we've picked our log bag of words model because it worked the best. 
I would say the Lord of the Rings is excellent. Okay? I didn't like the recent movie on TV. It's not good and a waste of time. Okay? Now, as a human reader, I can tell the first one should be positive and the second one should be negative. I cleaned my text up okay? because you want to make sure that any new data gets the same data transform applied to it. I have to clean it up. Okay, and I have to transform it. Okay, the transform function just creates that, like, predictors that um, um, vocabulary by documents matrix. So it was just transform, not fit transform, and predict the new one. And it gave us these um, this array of probability, or the prediction. So it says the first one's positive, the second one's negative. Cool. Here's something I like even more, although it's in scientific notation, which makes it really hard to read. Um, using the predict proba function, <laughs> You can actually get the probabilities. So what are these numbers? Well, this is the likelihood of the first category, which I'd have to figure out if that's positive or negative. And this is the likelihood of the second category. And given that the answer is positive, this column is likely positive. Because that's 0.999. Okay, and this one is point one two three zeros and then an eight. So the model picked positive as the answer because the likelihood of it being positive came up as 0.99. So not only are we getting that one right, ostensibly, um, we're getting it really right. It's very close. The probability of the second one being negative on this side, a negative, is almost one. Like, I think rounding-wise, like pretty much came up as one. And so what we can tell is in this, these two examples, we're getting them almost like the the answers are are very clearly um, pulled to one side or the other and so what we what we did in the project was we printed out all the probabilities for our uh, testing data set found the ones that were predicted with the highest classification probability right so these would be very high it said that these are the most representative objects and then looked at what overlapped on those. It's where you could do a topics model or you could just look at the words or you could just um, print them out. Right? So there's a lot of ways to do this, but um, we took those, uh, the top 25 of each one that had the, the strongest predictive abilities that were correct, first problem, <laughs> and then um, essentially summarized those. So the model appears to be picking up well on these types of characteristics. Then we looked at the opposite problem. So here are the ones we're getting the most wrong. So the probability was in the wrong direction for the wrong group. And what is common among those? So why are we missing these? So it's a way to really dig into to your question here of what is doing the prediction. But, you know, we can all have to do topics. So uh, two seconds, uh, there's too much pollen, uh, and I'm going to blow my nose, and then we'll start topics. And I'll tell you, this is the very brief topics. If you want to learn more about topics, I have like a longer lecture on this in my other class that I can send you the link to. So everybody take a quick bathroom break, and we'll blow my nose. Okay, a lot better. This what book covers? Oh, I don't know if there's a whole book. Okay, well I'll give everybody just a quick break. Um, you should definitely read the Griffiths and Stivers. Griffiths. Oh. Um. Oh, 
Oh, the book. I thought you were asking what book. Sorry. Yes, it does cover it. But I also heavily recommend um, reading. There's several papers by Griffiths and Stivers um, about topics. So there's this PNAS paper, and it's not like it's got a lot of equations, but it's not terrible. And then they have another one that's a lot better. I think it's this one. Yeah, this is the one with all the pretty pictures. And so it just um, really, really does a good job of like explaining how these things are dimensionalized. That's probably the best one. It's like that link looks crazy, but <laughs> um, and it talks about the algorithms too. If you're interested in the difference between a LDA and a Gibbs and all that kind of stuff. I don't remember what the textbook covers. So I've taught topics multiple times. They have it in the semantics section. Sentiment, sentiment, blah, blah, blah. We did all this. Ah. No, hidden layers. I don't remember where they talk about topics. Oh, text summarization. Chapter 6, 343. I'm just looking at it real quick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This talks about the matrix, collocation. They're making this complex. Yeah, triangling. Yeah. It's pretty good. I haven't read it in a while, but it looks pretty good. I keep hoping they'll finish my way. Guys, I don't understand. Like, the lawn thing around here is very serious. Like, when one person starts mowing, the whole freaking street has to mow. It's ridiculous. Anyways, okay, I'm working on LDA to VEC models to combine LDA and Dr. VEC. Ooh! Ooh, do you have like a paper or a thing or something or a tutorial or a thing on? That you could send me. <laughs> Doctor Vec is so uh, so complicated sometimes, but anyways. <coughs> yes, please send it to me. I would I I would like to look at that. Um, I'm not sure it'll work for a project I'm thinking of, but can't hurt to try, right? Okay, so distractions aside, let's talk about topics now. Okay. So the main concept of the topics model, and topics models are a part of a broader set of semantic models called um, vector space models, sometimes called uh, distributional models. And I have, if you're like really interested in this stuff, um, I have several papers that I use in my other class that kind of explain this concept of like what is a distributional model and it goes through back of words and TF-IDF and then continues. So there's a whole broad set of these types of approaches. But when I think about like what do analytics people do if they love topics? <laughs> so there's, it's less likely that they're going to do the more um, traditional um, science-y ones and more likely to pick topics. And that it's built on this concept of understanding what people do when they read. Okay? So there's a whole set of theoretical models on understanding reading from Kinch that uh, sort of describe the reading process. Right? So the first thing we have to do is, well, other than visual, visual seeing, right? If we're hearing or we're reading, the first thing you have to do is actually process the input signal. But after that, once I've read the word, 
what I've got to do is retrieve concepts from memory. And once I've built those concepts, that's very dynamic. So as we're reading along, we might think that we're reading about X, and then a new piece of information comes in, and we're actually reading about Y. And the example that people love to use is the word bank. I wish I had an, a better one, but bank, bank is a word. What is, what is with the mowing? Anyway, bank is a word that could be attributed to banks, like money, or it could be attributed to river banks. And now river bank is less used, um, but so you're reading along, you might think, oh, bank, money. And then you keep going, you're like, wait, nope, I'm totally wrong. They're talking about oil. Okay. Um, and so that's why it's dynamic. So we're constantly updating what information we consider important in this retrieval process. Okay. And we use that context to create what's called a gist representation. Okay. So gist representation is kind of a summary. Um, often people will have to describe these as mental models. So as I'm reading, I'm building a mental model of what's um, happening. Okay. And what we do to help build us is um, as we're going, reading, hearing, right, we're predicting what's coming next. So we, ex we generate this expectation of these concepts that will occur later in the text. And so this is what makes mystery novels so much fun, is because they're constantly trying to break that expectation. And so you're predicting what's going to happen next, and if you get it right, you're like, oh, well, I knew it all along. But if you get it wrong, they go so surprised at a twist, right? Because we are constantly doing this. What's going to happen next? What do I think is the next set of words here? And the reason we do that is because it helps us go faster. We don't like to think very hard, so we like to predict what's next, so things are ex as expected. Okay. So bank here might pull up federal and reserve. Ah, perfect. Um, I'm going to lose this in the chat later, so I'm going to just open it and hit save. Okay, perfect. Thank you. <clears throat> um, one of the biggest problems, though, with reading is the idea we've talked about this all semester this is gonna be the last time we hit it is polysemes right so multiple senses of the word multiple definitions make our processing difficult it makes computer processing difficult it just is in general a problem um, that allows us to be very flexible with language but in general capturing that effect this idea that things are are have you know ten different definitions can um, can be hard with traditional models, okay. and it's hard for us on reading. But just representation really just allows us to create this theme, right? This understanding to disambiguate the sense problem, okay. and so this happens, um, you know, pretty much any time. So <laughs> the other day, here's a here's a funny story of this exact moment. So the other day I'm talking in Slack because I can't escape Slack, and we just have we have this like ongoing chat of just random nonsense with a couple of friends, and I'm in a Zoom call, and I'm like, we're talking we're talking on the side about everyone's backgrounds because that's what you do, and I'm just like, ah, this person is so adorable, like I just want to like pick him up and put him in my pocket. He's so cute, <laughs> um, because he's just a uh, super nice generous guy. Well, before that, we had been talking smack about somebody else. Like, I can't believe this person just said that, blah, blah, blah. So I'm like, this person's so normal. And my friend's like, wait, what? What? What's happening? Because <laughs> she got lost in the, like, switch there. And so the, the overarching theme, right, was that we were talking crap about somebody um, because they were being obnoxious. And then I'm like, but they're so adorable. And they're like, wait, what? <laughs> what just happened? I'm like, oh, no, sorry. I'm talking about this other person who's now um, leading the conversation. Right? And um, we took like 10 messages to sort out where they had gotten lost. Because their just representation of our conversation was like, we were just um, uh, talking bad about somebody. And then I switched suddenly. Um, so that sense was didn't make sense anymore. 
I just want a quick contrast. Now, this is in one of the, the Stivers and Griffiths paper, and I like to really use it in a couple different lectures because it best captures the differences to me between different approaches. So we have over here on the left side these traditional bubble style, style models. Okay, these are um, they're not network models, but you can kind of apply that idea of a of a network analysis to this. They call them semantic networks. Um, in this paper, they didn't mean mathematical networks, but we could think about that. Okay. So uh, a network style model where uh, concepts words are related to other words, and you have a probabilistic relationship between them, some sort of count, you know, how frequently do they occur together, how similar are they, whatever number you want to attribute to this model. B here is a traditional, what's considered a latent semantic analysis. Uh, sometimes this is called latent semantic indexing. And the idea of a latent semantic analysis is almost like factor analysis. You reduce the um, bag of words counts into dimensions. So you have a vector, uh, a, a data frame that has words by dimensions and the documents by dimensions. Okay. And what you can do then is look at how all of the words are related to each other on those dimensions. Okay. And the dimensions are meant to represent the themes in the text. Okay. So what what is it that's occurring in the text? Why do all of these words occur together? Well, if I look at them, I can see up here, I can see the dimension of banks, okay? I can see the dimension of rivers, and then we've got this kind of oil um, drilling dimension okay? or grouping. Uh, this is in two-dimensional space. This is probably be better in three-dimensional space since there's clearly three separate kind of categories, but uh, the idea behind latent semantic analysis is that you are creating these um, these dimensional spaces, which then you can compare words or you can compare documents. Uh, the last one here is a topics model where you're still creating dimensions uh, in a sense, but instead you have sort of the probability of each of those topics or those dimensions um, related to words. So we've got a words by topics matrix where we can see like the kind of strongest words for each one and that gets at your question of like what's predicting. So for that dimension, that topic, here are the most popular words. And then for topic number two, the most popular words, rivers, topic number three, oil. Now with topics models, I also get a topics by documents matrix where we can use that for classification. And so this is kind of like what I was trying to represent when I was just talking. So we end up with this words by dimensions matrix or this dimensions by documents matrix where you can find similar documents. Okay, so if you've ever tried um, using like Google Scholar and searching, it's kind of using this concept. It's not quite what it's doing. It's actually using a different page algorithm, but this is the concept of like these two documents are similar because they have the same dimensions. Or more popular is to use words by dimensions. That is SVD. <laughs> Mathematically, this is a, is a singular vector decomposition, yes. That is LSA's version of dimension reduction. Yes. And generally you use one or the other. You don't tend to do dimensions by dimensions, although you could, but it would be weird. Okay. Uh, where was I going with this? So mostly the input into an LSA is a TF IDF most common input. Now for topics, which is the bottom half here, the distribution of the data is weighted probabilistically instead. So the input matrix is a little bit different. And then the most common math for topics model is LDA, which is latent. I'm going to butcher the second word, latent direct licked analysis. I'm never sure where the accent on the second word goes. Um, but an LDA is the reduction technique used to create the topic. 
So these are probability distributions, which are a lot easier to interpret than these dimensions. Um, I always tell people to think of dimensions like factor analysis as the weighted score of how useful that word is to that dimension. Probabilities are much easier. It's the likelihood of that word in that dimension or that topic. Um, so you end up with words by topics and topics by documents. So let's use topics modeling to help us understand our reviews. And then I want to, the perils of punctuation is where we'll also end. Okay. So this is a very good visualization technique. Um, and there is, in, in Gensum, there's a really amazing like plugin that allows you to create interactive HTML documents for this. And so this helps us know what is in the text rather than just the prediction. And you can actually use this as an unsupervised classification technique. That's not quite what we're doing here, but it's not too hard to extend to that. All right, so the package we're going to use here is Pi LDA Viz, and that package allows us to create these cool visualizations. Um, so we load this, we load the Jensen version of it. Don't skip that step or it won't run. <laughs> Matplotlib and Jensen. I'm still getting this kind of sparse warning and corpora here. So what I'm going to do to understand these better is separate the reviews into positive and negative. I think it's very tempting to um, just run the entire data set and pick two topics because clearly there's a positive and a negativity here. But a limitation of topics analysis here is that it's going to grab these kind of general overarching themes. And depending on what the reviews are, you may end up with like 35 topics that are about the fact that, you know, all of these reviews are about sci-fi movies. And all of these reviews are about horror movies. And so what we want to do is like treat these as separate data sets to help us see if there's a, a global difference in those um, reviews. Like, are there some words that we see at the top that are more popular in one than the other? Now, you can run them all together. I just think it was harder to interpret. So I always separate mine out first. Okay. Uh, that's just what I was saying. There are lots of things going on in each review. So topics, you can't force it to find the topic you're looking for. So I can't force it to, like, give me the positive topic, give me the negative topic. It's going to pick the most coherent sort of dimension first, right? So all these words pull together. And it may be that you have to use other variables to separate them out as well. So if you have a really mixed, a lot of reviews here that are on lots of different types of things. So these are all movies, but you have, we all know that movies vary a lot. You might not... Um, totally get a coherent answer because you're going to be capturing the gist representations of those individual movie styles more than um, the kind of global positiveness. But we can see. All right. So to split them up using pandas, this, I, I find this super awkward, but this is also is in base R is super awkward, right? So what we do is we take our data set and we split the data set where the sentiment column is positive and we only return those rows. So this creates a true false since it gives me all the rows where the sentiment data is positive. And then I took the first thousand just so this would run in a reasonable amount of time. And then here's a key factor you need to uh, tokenize them. Before the tokenization was part of the um, input, the count vectorizer, the TF idea, now what we're going to do is uh, create a column that's already tokenized. I do the same thing for negative. Now, the first step <clears throat> for Gensum using topics modeling, now in R, there's also a topics package that's actually really um, also pretty easy. We're just going to keep going with Python here. Um, that is, you have to create a dictionary. Okay, the dictionary just creates the vocabulary list. 
Um, just like our fit transform that we did, we got to create a vocabulary list. And that's the corpora function in Jensen. Dot dictionary, and you just plop in the reviews. So this is all of our positive reviews tokenized. And now they're testing the fire alarm system. <laughs> it's a loud Saturday. <laughs> Then we're going to create a document by term matrix to input into the um, LDA function. So our positive dictionary, the function here is dot doctabo. So that's documents to bag of words. Now this creates that um, input as a count vectorizer matrix, which then the LDA function will transform into a probability matrix. So this just creates documents by terms. And then the numbers in there are counts. So Doctabo for each document in our reviews. Maybe he's done mowing. Oh, crap. All right, so the LDA model. So a topics model in Jinsum is LDA model. There are various forms of LDA models, and then there are topics models run with a Gibbs algorithm, which is Bayes, or correlated topics model, and I have a lecture that covers how to run those in R, if you're interested. In Jensen, though, we put in our corpus, which is our document by term matrix or term by document matrix. ID to word here is the dictionary. Because what's happening underneath the hood is it has like a, a, um, a tuple list, right, of, of each word and a number. So it assigns each word like a, a, an ID. And then the doc term matrix is like IDs by documents. And so having both just memory wise is a little easier. Uh, the LDA, I'm not positive what Jensen does. But in R, there's a specific way to do LDA versus Gibbs. Gibbs only. Sam not just like sampling, like a Gibbs algorithm. Um, so I cannot, without going through the help, tell you exactly what Jensen does, though. Okay, dictionary. How many topics? I, I don't know. Right? So I'm going to start with 10. We'll see what happens. Because we can always go smaller or larger. Random state here. I think this is the first and only time I haven't used 42. This just picks a place to start for this iterative process here. Update every word. Okay. Chunk size here. This is how many words to use at once. I'm going against my better judgment here uh, and using larger chunks. But we can manipulate this factor going smaller or larger. They run through 10 passes of the data. So these are kind of normal defaults right, that we can play with to tune our model if we're interested. This is an automatic alpha model. Okay, alpha is a measure of co not cohesiveness, like well-formedness of topics, um, sort of like how well the items group together and are different from items and other ones. Um, I items any words here. You can do a fixed model, but I will tell you that LDA alpha mo LDA auto models tend to run a lot better. And per word topics, yes, definitely want that. Do that exact same thing for negative. So these slides look very similar because it's just one's positive, one's negative. And then the output, the natural output from Jensen is not super readable. So it'll print the topics in order. So here's the zeroth topic, number one. And then it prints the weight. So this is the probability, times, and then the word. <clears throat> so wondering, covered, importance, blah, blah, blah. And then it just keeps going forever and ever and ever. So uh, while I don't mind this option, because I could print it and use it for something else, there are much better ways to Vision, to view the topics, especially with their weights. Uh, so I could create um, essentially a graph showing the weights. 
or my favorite thing and I need to I need to um, make a note here <clears throat> I'll rerun this later but quick and dirty oh okay it's in the actual notes I just have not rerun this so a quick warning here this code in the lecture notes I apparently have not updated this where it says comma in jobs equals one I did do it here in the note notes itself. Be sure you include, if you're a Windows person, this in jobs equals one, or this will never finish for reasons I don't totally know. Um, it just like hangs, it gets stuck. And uh, on a Windows machine, if you have in jobs equals one, it will actually run and finish at some point. Um, on a Mac, it doesn't hurt you to have that. Uh, but it on a Windows machine without that, you'll it'll just lock up okay and that's also true for the server okay, so use njobs equals one because it's a windows server we're moving to unix yay uh anyway so what do we do here pile davis jensen prepare you put on the name of the model the document by term matrix and the dictionary i you tell it to save html so save that output so let's, I'm going to hit knit so you guys get the updated note. Boop. And that's going to take 27 minutes to run, probably. So I'm going to, while that's running, show you the outputs. <clears throat> All right. So one of the first questions was, how many topics should I have? And so this creates this really cool visualization over here. Let me zoom out a little bit more. So you get this little circle here that helps you understand the proportion of variance. Okay. So this one's very big. The first one will always be the largest. This and then smaller, smaller, smaller. It's the way eigenvalues work. Um, but really, this looks like it's two topics because okay. everything else is like tiny and not very big. Maybe three. Maybe this is number three. So I can look at three, but it's pretty small, right? So in reality, this is two topics okay, that re best represent the positive data. Okay. So I'm gonna click on number one here to get number one over here. Now I have not done a whole lot with this relevance metric, um, and I haven't. I've looked at the paper a little bit, and I'm not sure I totally get the usefulness of it. So I'm gonna ignore that. But here are the most popular words for topic one on the positive side. And uh, the first one's a comma. So that's not useful. The second one's a period, also not useful. And then we get kind of a confusing um, piece. We've got not, but, okay, film, okay, open and close parentheses, not great, movie, mm, one, would like good good makes sense right <laughs> great makes sense maybe the exclamation point makes sense and so we can look at the the most uh top most relevant terms for that topic okay. now this piece here kind of shows you like where it splits so if i click on number two what you'll see <clears throat> is that um the comma here is very popular, like it's uh, 15,000 commas in this data set. Um, and most of it is for topic one, like most of the weight of the commas goes towards topic one. <laughs> the other half goes to topic two. So the, the red part represents kind of how much um, they represent that topic of the percent of total um, tokens that, that exist for that word. So one here is a popular is a more popular word than mannerisms, um, but the weight of it to topic two is a little less. Now, let's see here. We've got really funny. That makes sense. Connery. Okay, that's a that's a name. Movie. Women. Men. Hero. Bond. So we can kind of see a, a couple of adjectives that are more positive base. Um, the not here is a little confusing. Um, but again, we're not capturing uh, context very well. And then I also wanted to use this as the perils of punctuation, which is just a really great phrase, but we really should 
We didn't clear out the punctuation in this data set because um, we were using it in the uh, unsupervised tasks, right? Especially because some of those models use exclamation points and that kind of stuff. But as we can tell here, since quotes and commas and periods are very popular, they may be overriding nearly everything else. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, what we want to do is probably go back and take, just take out all the punctuation and see what kind of different picture we get. All right, so let's con contrast this. Oh, it's mad at me. Something that doesn't run. Okay, well, I'll see if I... Oh, that darn labels thing. Okay, well, I'm going to have to fix this. That is why the data is not updated. I'll have to fix this, but um, be sure when you're running this on your own that you use this in jobs thing. Okay, just my only comment. Um, I'll have to fix the typo in the extra model utilities is um, out of date. Like they updated one of the packages and now it's grumpy. That's essentially the problem. Okay. So for negative ones, it's clearly still two topics. Maybe some little small three, four, and five here. But like largely one topic and maybe a second one. Whereas in the positive data, what we see is one big topic, another kind of big topic, and then a bunch of noise. And so let's look here. Well, check out commas, periods, movie not but, film. Okay. So these all overlap. So they're not very distinguishing, but no one would see. It's pretty like a good phrase. Like, no one wants to see this. Okay. Bad. Uh, let's look at topic two here. Okay. Do notice that the numbers at the top are changing. So the weights look bigger, but that's because the numbers are smaller. Okay. Um, opening, alien, so they didn't like the alien movie. Famous, driving, so hardly. So here we're getting a little bit more, I think, of the movies that people didn't like. <clears throat> so this will allow us to start figuring out what is driving those predictions. Okay. And then also take out punctuation. All right, so let's talk about summary. We covered a broad range of stuff in this lecture. Okay. But we talked about pre-built lexicon models that allow us to predict polarity if we don't have any other real options. We could do, also do cluster analysis. We could complement with this topics model because that is an unsupervised technique. Okay. Then we um, very briefly did supervised techniques. And the nice thing about the supervised techniques is we had a, another two weeks on that already. So um, you can just apply a lot of those same algorithms that you've learned before to this type of question. Okay, it clearly works pretty well. Um, so we can extend that to work to that to see if context matters. Now 90% is pretty good. Like it would be hard, I think, to push too, too much higher. And then we looked a little bit of visualization and um, I highly recommend this idea of, calc of grabbing the probabilities. So instead of um, separating out and taking all the positive data and all the negative data, I could find the best representations of positive and negative and run the topics model on that. So take my probability, predicted probabilities on my test data sort those and grab the reviews that are the most positive and the reviews that are the most negative. And I don't mean most positive, like it's a glowing review. I mean like that the algorithm said, these are clearly clear indicators for positive. And then what is in that? And that's what we, what we did for another analysis. And it was very useful without the punctuation. And that is the end. So you made it to the end. Congrats, we survived.